we need to talk about Sir Bertrand Bell. This is your spoiler warning for episode three. Bertrand Bell has fallen. We're only blessed with three episodes of good old Bert in campaign three, but his origins lie elsewhere. What was Bertrand's first appearance? What exactly were his last words? Did Matt and Travis plan Bertrand's inevitable demise? Hey Critters, Billy here. Let's jump into all of that and more. We are first introduced to Sir Bertrand Bell, not in Campaign 3, but in, and very minor spoilers for Campaign 1, a post-Campaign 1 one-shot, The Search for Grog. In The Search for Grog, Vox Machina is attempting to find and rescue their friend and ally, Grog's soul, that was stolen and trapped in the Plain of Pandemonium. While at the Platinum Sanctuary, where leaders of Vasselheim have gathered, Vox Machina explains their problem and the only person to volunteer to help is none other than Sir Bertrand Bell. I'm in my late 50s, early 60s, a devilish silver fox son of a bitch. Introducing and hyping himself up as a renowned warrior and adventurer. Have you ever heard of the Whispering Werewolf of the North? Yes, I slayed that beast. I'm sure you've read about it. <laughs> yes. Perhaps the, the horrible hippogriff of, of the West. <laughs> yeah, any takers? Uh, yes, I've, I've heard of that one. That, also me. And only meaning to act as an advisor, as someone who's actually been to the Plain of Pandemonium, Bertrand finds himself as Vox Machina's actual guide. I have been to this Pandemonium Plain of Pandemonium many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> well then, Sir Bertrand, it would seem that you would be the necessary guide for such a journey. Consider yourself the guide. Oh, oh no, I, I, I merely meant to, uh, I would advise them on, on the trip. Yes, oh. on the trip, you will guide them. Bertrand being his braggadocious self does not back down from puffing his chest. Master Bell, I have heard many a story about you. Are you uh, sure you're up for the challenge? <laughs> up for the challenge? My goodness, my dear woman, is the challenge up for me. Bertrand isn't stepping up for honor, but for clout and for potential coin, but realizes offering up his services was probably the wrong move. Um, have we talked about hazard pay for this? Uh, any sort of coin or... Uh... I'm going to explain to you the term volunteer. Vox Machina, needing to rest, is worried about leaving Grog alone for too long, asks Bertrand if he will be okay. Wait, you've been to the Plain of Pandemonium, will he be okay? Yeah, yes, he will be fine. <laughs> Once we're there, we will tap into the local fauna and concoct uh, uh, a bit of an antidote in it that should right him for our- There's um, local fauna? Yes, uh, many uh, different uh, plants and, and animals. <gasps> what? It, you'll see when we, when <laughs> we get there. Scanlan and Keyleth do not believe Bertrand for one bit, and after an inside check and whisper from Matt, Keyleth asks Bertrand about Do you have any flowers from the last time you visited Pandemonium? Alas, I like to collect flowers on my journey. I left a few of the pressed flowers that I had at <gasps> home. I don't have any with me, unfortunately. Mm. Scanlan, I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> it's clear Bertrand is lying here, especially when Vox Machina actually makes it to the plane of Pandemonium. Ah oh, yes! The winter winds of the Pandemonium Plain! I recognize it anywhere! Bertrand, how do we get out of this? You know, it seems the seasons have changed since I was last here! He's clearly never set foot there. Although clearly found out for his deception, Bertrand joins in the battles of the quest to save Grog, even asking to become a temporary Vox Machina member at one point. By the way, can I get a temporary Vox Machina credit when this is all over and, you know, people are like, oh, Vox Machina is so brave. Also, Bertrand Bell. It'll do a lot for my, you know. And not to give much more away about the search for Grog, just know that Bertrand fights and may or may not have fallen unconscious a couple of times. We see Bertrand yet again in a one-shot before Campaign 3. Continuing the adventure from the search for Grog, we have the search for Bob. The majority of Bertrand in this one-shot can really be summed up with flirting from Lev Tal, the elf cleric woman played by Liam. You're 350 years old. Don't you think I wear it well? Oh, yeah. Mr. Bell does, don't you, Mr. Bell? Yes, yes, it looks marvelous on you. God, I forgot I was even here. <laughs> Pushed further by their actual relations. Come along, Mr. Bell, you're with me. <clears throat> Let me teach you the wisdom of the ages. Oh, Jesus. 
uh, is that in reference to some sort of meditation before Touching sleep? by the beard of oh. Oh. <laughs> really? didn't say it, I rang his okay. bell, it happened. There you go. Oh. Oh. Nice. Eventually, Bertrand decides to part ways due to all the trouble and damage he's taken. Wow. If it's all the same. <laughs> oh, you lived? I hope I never see any of you ever, ever again. I quit, and I'm going into retirement. Goodbye. And I just start walking. Bertrand starts walking <laughs> out of what the... Now keep these notes from Search for Bob in the back of your head for Campaign 3. And before jumping into Campaign 3, some time does pass, Bertrand, eventually ending up in Drusar, and possibly part of the group mentioned by Bertrand in Episode 3, the Bevy, is hired by Lord Arix Estras to look into the Ivory Syndicate. The mission explained by Lord Estras. This braggadocious warrior was indeed once under my employ, before he abandoned his troop mid-mission. What happened to his troop? One fell. The others left. Moving back up to the beginning of Campaign 3, we first meet Bertrand during the group's first campaign encounter. Encounter both in battle and with each other, our old codger human fighter Sir Bertrand Bell makes his grand introduction. Yes, for the good of Dressar, <laughs> I will enter the fray with you! And you see a uh, 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 gentleman in his late 70s, er, early 80s, um, with beautiful silver-trimmed facial hair. A good receding hairline going, and, and a nice ponytail pulled tight oh. in the back. Now, Travis mentioned Bertrand's age being in his late 70s or early 80s, although comparing to the search for Grog, where Bertrand is set to be in his late 50s to early 60s, it all doesn't really technically match up. As the search for Grog took place in 812 PD, and Campaign 3 starts in 843, 31 years later, which would make Bertrand's age more like 90? A mistake either way, maybe Bertrand was a bit younger than originally stated in the first one-shot. Post-battle, the party makes their way back to the tavern and introductions are made. You're right, this is terribly rude of me. I was just so excited seeing you all. Uh, my name is Sir Bertrand Bell. Sir. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. Bertrand. You're, Sir, you're a, a knight? Real knight? Are you a noble? Uh, not a noble. Uh, a knight is generous, but it was a title bestowed upon me and I didn't uh, show it away. <laughs> Bertrand eventually mentioning that these new allies might want to group up for work from a potential employer that Bertrand has worked with before, Lord Estras. You all displayed tremendous talent, and I know someone that would pay well, perhaps for uh, services that you might render. Bertrand's looking to possibly mend his relationship with Lord Estras and make some coin while he's at it. The group agrees to follow Bertrand and are taken by surprise by a test battle with this strong old orc lord. We, the viewer, get our first glimpse on Bertrand's battle strategy and tactics. Yes, you're all doing very well. <laughs> Show him what Bertrand Bell and his sorcerous swords have to offer, and I'll just very jauntily make my way towards the fireplace. <laughs> and I don't know if there's a, a whiskey or brandy or anywhere, but I'll just post my elbow up on the mantel and, um, and offer encouraging he's words. He's just getting cold because he's an old man. <laughs> <laughs> there, oh you're God. doing well. There, there is indeed a bottle of half-drinking brandy there, kind of on one of the side shelves. You can just grab and start. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll unsheathe my uh, gambler's blade, and I'll take my sniffer of scotch, and I'll throw it at the burning Esteros. <laughs> oh. Okay. Oh. <laughs> oh. There's a dull thud on the back of your head, Fern. And then a strange wetness begins to creep down the back <laughs> of your shoulders. It's an odd sensation. You hear the shattering of glass at the same time and glance over your shoulder to see Bertrand Bell standing there at the end of a, a large arc throw. You got this! <laughs> The group starts to see the true nature of Bertrand. He wants the respect, notoriety, and gold by just sort of tagging along. He did it back with Vox Machina, and he's looking to do it again with this new group some 30 years later. I mean, hell, Ashton goes a bit far making Bertrand pay once Estros calls off the fight. Oh, let's throw a knife at Bertrand. <laughs> <laughs> enough, everyone, enough! <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, you participated. Cool. As you're reacting to that, Lord Estros walks past and puts his hand on your shoulder and goes, <laughs> and just pushes you out of his way. <laughs> the group groups up at a tavern and orders some breakfast and talks about what happened, not being very happy with Bertrand about the situation. Did you know he was going to do that? He, on occasion, has similarly uh, uh, auditioned people in, in that way. 
but I've I've also seen him just hold a natural conversation before. May I make a suggestion? Um, yes. Next time we're in a situation like that, it would be great for you for to tell us. Mm. Right. <clears throat> yes. Oh, of course. <clears throat> Did you go through a similar audition? Yeah, <laughs> many a time. In fact, with several groups, so I have a comparison. Did, did you actually sure fight in any of those au uh, auditions? Yes. Can I just, uh, use mage hand. I'm just going to pick up one of the shots of whiskey and send it over to Bertrand and dump it on him. Oh, <laughs> oh I'm so sorry about that. It's not a, not a problem. It's only the most expensive velvet in my kit. Well, it already had a big hole in it. I mean, after all. Yes. But the group continues to learn about each other when we're introduced about Pate de Rolo, in which Bertrand then spills some backstory out. What do you know about the de Rolos too? Oh, <laughs> I should say so. Yeah, the question is, how have you not heard of me before this? I, I hold out my lapel pin. I mean, clearly you recognize the symbol of Vox Machina. Mm. You see a circular pin on the lapel with a V and an M. Vox Machina from on Taldore, the, the, the defeaters of the Whispered One. No, you don't? Oh, that's a weird band name. No of them haven't heard of you. Ah, well, yeah, there, there were many stages to Vox Machina and its glory, but I was there in the heyday of it all, uh, rescuing um, uh, Frog, uh, Grog, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Strong, Strongbone. Uh, this is, I mean, the, the world is a very, very <laughs> small place. I, uh, I remember uh, 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 Keyleth and uh, uh, Vex, Vexalia, all, all of them. Uh, dear, dear friends that I have not, not seen in a while. <laughs> but uh, Lorna asking Bertrand what he wants out of all of this. Bertrand, speaking of, <clears throat> what do you want out of all of this? Oh, just to foster young talent, uh, so you make your own place in the world. And you know, the coin is not bad. Mm. Really, you should look at this as a shortcut. So you'd be taking some of the coin too? Well, naturally, I think we'll so share. you'd actually be fighting this time? You'd actually be fighting with yeah, us? Did I not join you in the streets? It feels like you're more of like a chaperone. I am more of a consultant. I mean, I have so much wisdom to share. But yes, I, I tend to get my blade dirty from time to time. I think you remember I gave that table what for. <laughs> the group agrees to take on the preliminary mission offered by Lord Estras, which upon satisfactory completion would bring them a contract for ongoing work. That mission, to investigate a warehouse of Lord Estras's storage supplies, supplies that he uses to privately fund the Dial Hall, a learning center in the Core Spire, and there have been signs of theft, Pradash Textiles is that warehouse where there has been signs of theft. The group is to investigate and be rewarded with gold, both in advance and more depending on the outcome. After an undercover trip inside, Bertrand and Imogen do some sneaky stalking of the suspicious no manager, Dennis. What are you doing? What are you talking about? What are you, you don't have no disguise? What I do don't mean? have a disguise, Bertrand. <laughs> Plus, I mean, it's a tavern. People come to drink. Did you use my name? <laughs> After confirming that Danis did indeed enter the Weary Way Tavern, the two return to the rest of the group at Pradaj Textiles to inform them. When they arrive, Bertrand offers to stay outside and give a bird call in case of danger. I can, I, I can stay, you go. I look, I've made myself. Oh, you look very different. <laughs> <laughs> Should we go inside? Sure, are you sure, Barry? Yeah, I can, I can do a bird call if someone comes. Okay. Ah! Oh, all right. Or you can, you Okay, are you gonna be like across the street just keeping an eye? How are we gonna? Awesome. I'm gonna have Laudna send a message to you every once in a while just to make sure that you're you're safe, all right? And I'll do the same thing where I just inform her of my position every, how often? Well, Five seconds, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. Eventually, the group finds information regarding Dennis adjusting the books. The entire party makes their way back, once again, to the Weary Way Tavern. Fresh Cut Grass goes upstairs to listen for Dennis, with everyone but Bertrand, who stayed down by the bar. The group runs into the room, and a battle begins with a pale, cloak-wearing dwarf and his children, some form of shade creepers. Bertrand eventually making his way upstairs to join the fray. I'm coming to fucking snake! <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I'll take a swing at the dark little uh, scary individual right in front of me. Yeah, as you just like push right past Imogen, you see the creature is now like herring her from the front and you get right in its face, go for it. Uh, and I'll wager plus, plus three. Hell yeah, go for it. Gambler's blade. Nine points uh, pierce damage. It is now on the edge of your blade, like impaled. You see it grab it, like 
starts spitting out blood. It's still alive. <laughs> oh, God! <It's> like <laughs> <a one. laughs> it like splits in two on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and eventually decide to run into the darkness. I will run to the edge of the bubble and call out, Friends, where are you? Is <laughs> 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 that a reply? <laughs> Bertrand? Oh, okay, you're in there. That didn't help at all. Uh, you, know, you know the basic direction where they are. You kind of saw where they vanished, or at least where Dory ran into. So can I split the difference and just run in between the two and swing? There you just poof, you hit the back of Dorian. Take a swing. Ah! Oh, oh no! Oh no! Bertrand, oh, is that no. you? Oh, no, I'm so, I'm so sorry. Why would you do this to I me? I thought I had a plan. I literally, no one has stabbed me do up you, until this moment. I know how to get out of here. Do you want to leave? No, I, you just saw me run in here, Dad. And I'll just I start taking steps back out of the bubble. Oh I just want to unarm strike, try to open palm him somewhere. Do it. Crack, 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 crack. The red hot pain on your cheek as you just get the biggest backhand you've, and you've got a few backhands in your time, but this one, this one shakes the room. The dwarf escapes and Danis is dead. The party returns to Lord Estras for an update and their reward. Moving on to the Spire by Fire Inn to drink and celebrate. Bertrand becomes pretty drunk and is very excited for having a new group to be a part of and to make coin with. Bertrand starts throwing out some names for the group that all have a version of his name in them, but he seems at peace for the first time in quite some time, mentioning, I'm going to enjoy the night. This is, this is a long time coming. A pat okay. him on the back as we leave and say thank you for the, for the drinks. You're very welcome. I hope you know how special this is. It, you don't always find yourself with the ability to mingle with these type of people do a lot no i i, I do find it quite special I, I don't mingle with people very often so i yes. appreciate it very glad to have come across all of you are you sure we could parade around the spire <laughs> it's true bertrand should have retired years ago <laughs> yeah this is the latest i have stayed up in 30 years <laughs> <laughs> bertrand decides to go for a drunk stroll around the spire you want to help get upstairs? No, no, no. Every once in a while, you need to see the sunrise. And it might be that night for me. Okay, well, you want to get some sleep. Mm -hmm. I'll be back at it tomorrow. I didn't take as much damage as you did. You suddenly sense someone standing there. You kind of glance over, and you just see a silhouette. You sense this figure looking at you. And as they get closer to you, the the full height of your stance, you can tell the figure is a bit shorter than you. Cloak the hood maybe comes up to about your shoulders. <gasps> what did you say? Is it this dick? Is it the fucking dwarf? Is it the dwarf? Shorter. Why don't we have a conversation? <gasps> and you see beneath the cloak, there's a flash of metal as a familiar rapier glint hits the moonlight. Further in, where? Points deeper into the alley. Oh, I, I think I'm fine right where I am. It seems I have you at a disadvantage, sir. In a sudden flash of quick movement, unnatural speed, the cloak whisks and you feel a twinge of burning pain in your chest as you look down at the hilt of the rapier that's now up against your chest. As you glance down at it and kind of oh, cough for it, the blade withdraws again and goes this time into the abdomen, right up to the hilt. you lie bleeding in the alley. Your vision begins to blur. A coldness and a peace begins to come as the figure steps and blocks the moonlight and says, So Bertrand, how it is, huh? Good night. As, my, as the vision fades, I just say, Love tell. If you didn't catch it, Bertrand's last words were, Live tell, the elven woman from the one shots who Bertrand slept with, 
And so, the legend of Sir Bertrand Bell comes to an end. At the hands of this pale dwarf, Dwergar, or Dark One, whatever exactly it is, there's still quite a bit more to learn. This dwarf caught Bertrand's name? Was this someone Bertrand ran into before? Could this have been a setup by Lord Estros? Who really knows at this point? What's very interesting about this death, and many of us critters have speculated that Bertrand would die, and this was not Travis's true Campaign 3 main character, Matt Mercer did confirm this on Twitter. Travis wanted his C3 character to join in a little bit down the road, but Matt wanted Travis at the table for the first episode and more. When given the option to create a character, Travis was inspired to bring Sir Bertrand back, and Travis proposed the grim end, but agreed with Matt that he would not know how or when that would happen. Now that Bertrand is gone, Travis will return in the near future with his true character. I, like I'm assuming most of you, are really excited to meet Travis's main Campaign 3 character. But let's pour one out for the old codger who provided amazing comic relief. I loved Bertrand Bell. While I completely saw how an old man with low constitution that was clearly senile and had a habit of falling asleep wasn't quite the best ally in an adventuring group, but those were actually the aspects of this character that I loved. In Campaign 3, Bertrand is still that empty bravado, cocky silver fox, but he's aged quite a bit, so much that his level dropped from 18 in those one-shots to 5 in Campaign 3. Another giveaway, other than being two levels higher than the rest of the party, is Bertrand's magic sword, the Gambler's Blade Rapier. This is both a bit of a giveaway of Bertrand's fate, because it's a character starting out with a magic item, and its actual effect. Each day, the attuned wielder can choose a magical bonus between plus one and plus three, giving that bonus to both the attack and damage rolls at the expense of an equally negative penalty to their death saving throws. Bertrand took a plus three for the fight with a dwarf that day, so he had a negative three on his death saving throws later that night. I had a great time watching Travis work some comedic gold whenever it was Bertrand just being old or being the butt of some questionable yet mostly warranted bullying from the rest of the group. Ashton's knife throw, Imogen pouring whiskey, Dorian's slap and tripping of Bert. As we're, as we're walking, uh, Bertrand's right ahead of me. I'm just going to kick the uh, the outside of his heel oh. so that to make him trip over his own feet. That's it. Yeah. Eat shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm holding the cane so it falls under the arms. Like, ah! <laughs> The group was pretty mean to Bert, but he sort of needed to be put in his place. His death, well, I saw it coming a mile away. Once the group made their way back to the Spire by Fire Tavern, Bertrand's whole demeanor changed. I mentioned earlier, Bertrand felt happy for what seemed to me like the first time in a very long time. Finally having a purpose and maybe finding some new friends, maybe almost at peace with himself and life. He stayed up late to drink while he normally was sleeping by 7 p.m. Yes? Bertrand is naked. Oh, I'm sorry, it's 7.30. Were you asleep? 7.30 in the morning? No, it's still, it's barely... <laughs> oh, yeah, no, uh... We just saw each other 30 minutes ago downstairs. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. Who are you? I feel really... <laughs> Bertrand goes for a stroll to see the sunrise and, well, meets his unfortunate end. As Matt mentioned on Twitter, Bertrand would die, but Travis would not know how or when. But this seemed like an extremely scripted moment to me. But then again, Matt did roll a natural 20 with the second rapier attack that took the life from Bertrand, so maybe Bertrand could have lived to fight another day, but we'll never know. As railroaded as this specific moment was, I think it will do wonders for Campaign 3. These first three episodes, I wonder if they will be remembered as a bit of a prelude to Campaign 3 proper. Bertrand's death clearly will change the dynamic of the group, most likely bringing them together to be more invested in finding this evil dwarf. As this makes it very personal, it obviously leads to Travis's true character coming sooner than later as well. And don't forget that Lord Estros requires a group name for his contracts, and maybe not Bertrand's Bells, but I completely expect some nod to Bertrand in the name they choose, the Bell Tollers or the Bells or something like that. Bertrand will be missed, but this is only the beginning of Campaign 3. I'm very excited to see where it all goes. So what did you think about Bertrand Bell in Campaign 3 and his death in Episode 3? Let me know in the comments. Make sure to subscribe and hit that bell for Bertrand. More Critical Role videos every week on Current Kick. Until next time, see ya.